Uh, tonight, as you know, our focus is on digital surveillance, uh, which has really become one of the most hotly debated topics these days, and I would argue probably one of the most misunderstood too. Let me start with the issue in Canada. I think that's mainly what we're going to focus on tonight. And when I said it's misunderstood, you know, I'll put myself in this category. I'm a I'm national security reporter, and so much of this kind of is at a level that is difficult to understand because of, of much of the technology that's being discussed. Um, but, and it's very rare, what's frustrating in Canada is it's very rare to get you know, the other side. Um, it's, I know as journalists it's difficult to get somebody on the record from the government defending a program, and that typically is what happens with um, Ottawa. However, John Adams, who is the former head of CSEC, which is the electronic uh, surveillance agency in Canada. He's been, he's kind of a rare bird that actually speaks, and he was supposed to join us tonight, but unfortunately at the last minute had to pull out. Uh, I don't think it's a conspiracy theory, he really did have to uh, pull out. Um, but he, in May, uh, went before the Senate committee, and uh, he said, and I quote here, he was talking about Canadians posting on Facebook, and Canada holds the record in the world as uh, those who post the most, put the most information out there on Facebook. And we apparently also spend the most time online, which I don't know what that says about us, about Canadians. But um, what he said was, one half of Canada is stupid, sorry, talking about Canadians, one half is stupid and the other half is stupid <laughs> in regards to the information we put out there. So I guess let's start the conversation with, are, are, we, are we stupid? <laughs> What is our expectation with the information that we willingly put out there? Uh, so, perhaps unsurprisingly, I wouldn't necessarily agree with Mr. Adams. Um, he is making that upgrade to base as a signals intelligence chief. So, he comes from an organization that was in the business of collecting encrypted data and hacking systems. But really, the majority of intelligence gathering these days is through the open internet, what is publicly posted. Um, and if you speak with members of state in the United States or other jurisdictions, Twitter is like the number one place to get information for a lot of foreign policy decisions, as terrifying as that may be. <laughs> um, but no, I don't think that people are stupid. I, I think that um, what we're seeing is on one hand, um, we can make an argument that privacy controls aren't where they should be, but I think that's actually the wrong way to go about it. In Canada, we have a certain expectation that government, corporations, other parties won't be monitoring our communications. And certainly in the case of the government, <coughs> uh, the federal government of Canada is only permitted to access information about you on social media if there is a directed purpose. So ostensibly they are not permitted to sort of trawl Facebook and Twitter and everything else to collect our information. So in that sense we have laws that should be in place, or rather they exist, but they should be obeyed. Unfortunately found that the current federal government has not been necessarily abiding by those rules, which led the Privacy Commissioner of Canada to issue a stern rebuke to the Treasury Board uh, Minister Tony Clement and said, you know, you have to change this, to which Tony Clement had a similar comment and said, wow, I mean, if it's public on the internet, it's public. So I'm just going to play devil's advocate to a few points to try and spark some debate that was supposed to happen here. Um, but one of the other comments that you would hear quite often in public, and you hear this when the rare times that it is debated is, I don't have anything to hide. Why am I worried about this? You know, I'm, I'm not a criminal. I don't have any skeletons in the closet. I don't believe anybody would be that clean. But let, but you hear that all the time. So how do you? What's your response when people say that? I mean, uh, the, the challenge with a lot of court cases is you know you end up defending people who are not terribly appealing socially. So it's easier to make that claim. Um, so I think it's good to think of the kinds of people who, who have done nothing wrong. Um, they're good citizens, and they have a great deal to hide. And so you can think of uh, uh, either um, fathers or mothers that are going through really unpleasant custody battles, who they're, they're worried about the implications of being found or being identified. Those people aren't doing anything wrong. They do have something to hide, and they have good reasons. You can imagine if... Um, you are doing something that is legal, but could be looked at in the wrong way. And as a result, you suffer severe consequences. So I mean, it could be as simple, and this is 
course, from a real case, unfortunately, is going to a restaurant, seeing the wrong person who was under RCMP surveillance, the RCMP then finding a map, it was McDonald's or something like that, and, and then you get deported to Syria. This so, is the Iraq, the Iraq, Iraq case, right. So um, you don't have to have done anything wrong right. to uh, face very severe consequences to doing nothing wrong, simply having other people monitor what you're doing. So it, it's not about you know this will empower the pedophiles or empower the criminals. It's, it's about empowering individuals to live their lives, complicated lives, in which we have differing degrees of publicity that we accept or not at different times in our lives. So maybe we should step back a little bit and, and if you could explain to us what what is uh, we'll start first with the intelligence community. So, uh, Canadian uh, CSIS, our spy agency, and CSEC, our uh, electronic spy agency, what are they legally able to do under their, their comparable acts? What, what can they gather, gather without breaking the law? Uh, a great deal, depending on what they're looking at. So, I'll start with uh, uh, CSEC, the Communication and Security, Security Establishment of Canada, also known as NSA North. Um, so we're very different from the NSA. So CSEC operates under three mandates. Mandate A is spy stuff. We break into the uh, uh, foreign government's computers, say what happened in Brazil, to monitor how commodities are, are coming onto the market or not. Mandate B focuses on protecting government assets. So that means, you know, trying to make sure that the Revenue Canada isn't hacked uh, again. Um, <laughs> or going through and ensuring that Shared Services Canada can identify people who exploit the heart of the bug. Things like that. So those two mandates are very similar to NSA. Where CSEC varies is Mandate C. And Mandate C is where CSEC provides technical assistance to federal agencies when those agencies require assistance and when they come to CSEC with a warrant. So it isn't, you know, it isn't that our signals intelligence uh, guys sort of roam Canada, but they receive a warrant from the RCMP, CRA, CBSA, uh, CSIS, and then they're able to bring the full tools at their disposal towards whatever the target happens to be. The, the commissioner uh, who oversees CSEC um, has regularly said that their actions are lawful. Um, in the few instances where he wasn't certain whether it was lawful or not, one way or another, it did appear that CSEC was intentionally breaking the law. So we don't necessarily have a, a, a rogue agency in the sense that it is actively breaking the law. However, simply because something is legal, as many people in this room will know, does not make it constitutional or ethical. We actually haven't spoken about the Supreme Court ruling yet, so that's a, it's a great it's a great introduction. Um, I can get both of you to talk about it. Uh, on Friday, we had a, a, a significant ruling. Um, I think it came as a, a surprise to some. Um, it was a unanimous ruling, and uh, one of your colleagues in Ottawa, uh, Craig Forsessi, Forsessi, Forsees, Forsees um, called it revolutionary. That it, that it's going to have incredible. Impact. Um, so, if I could get you, one of you to describe so what the ruling means, but also we have a, a legislation that's being put before, um, that's going forward in very shortly, and it's going to have an impact on that. So, do you want to start? Okay. <laughs> Chris is setting me up here. I'm sure. I'm sure he knows more about it than I do. But, I mean, I read through the Supreme Court ruling on, on Friday. It was a, it's the Supreme Court in a case called Spencer. Uh, poor Mr. Spencer didn't actually benefit from this ruling, but I think the Canadian public as a whole will do uh, in the future. And, and if I was to try to boil it down to its essence, what the Supreme Court says in a unanimous ruling is that there are three conditions that are worthy of protection in terms of citizens' use of the internet. Uh, one they call secrecy, uh, the other they con call control, control of one's own communications, and the third, and, and in a way the, the condition that they were particularly calling attention to was the condition of uh, anonymity, which they regarded as something worthy of being protected under the law. That we should all have the right to remain anonymous, should we choose to do so, uh, and free from surveillance of our anonymity or intrusion into our anonymity in terms of the use of the internet. And 
the Supreme Court decision basically pledged to protect all three of those uh, aspects of our internet and wireless communications usage uh, in the future. We should have a right uh, to secrecy, we should have a right to control, and we should have a right to anonymity. And now the hard work starts. I mean, that, I think that's brilliant, and, and if Craig Forsyth says it's revolutionary, I can believe it. Um, now the hard work will start in terms of, of deciding how that general overview of the future of internet privacy is going to translate into specific laws. And, and from my perspective, I just end on this, I think it will have a huge impact on the ways in which um, intelligence agencies do their work uh, in Canada, and particularly around metadata collection. And then maybe, Chris, I could ask you to explain first uh, briefly what Bill C-13 is, which I know um, CJP has done a lot of work on, and then how this ruling could set that back or impact it. Um, sure, so C-13 is uh, uh, the newest version of lawful access. Um, so the, the first six, seven pages of the legislation um, address the sharing of intimate images. This is the one that started out as the child pornography, that it was uh, it, it, a political it, it, issue. It, that, that was the last round, but it, right. it's, it's been in the works for nine years, something like that, through successive governments, liberal and conservative. Since the 1990s. Yeah. Yeah. I can remember <laughs> the first version, mid-1990s. Um, and, and so the following bits of uh, C-13 are our lawful access powers. And so uh, lawful access can generally be said to refer to powers that enable enhance the police's or the authority's capability to collect intelligence. So it, it has a whole series of different components. Sort of the, the highlight pieces, if you will, is uh, one aspect of C-13 would identify <coughs> ISPs, telecommunications providers, who preserve or disclose information um, on when authorities come and ask. Uh, another aspect uh, includes the ability to install malware. Uh, so, if um, you have an iPhone, an Android, a car, <laughs> um, and authorities have to um, track where you are, the bill will allow them to covertly install, manipulate, or remove software malware. Um, that may also apply to transmission data, it's not entirely clear. And in both of those cases, the grounds will be on suspicion as opposed to belief. So, very low standards is. Uh, I believe um, this was said in the committee, it was the spidey sense level of protection, uh, which is great because I know that David, Fer David Fuhr, the uh, current director of CIVIC, has been using that for some time. It's going to be the parliamentary that we listen to him. Uh, and so those are perhaps two of the most concerning aspects because it would facilitate the free flow of information from government or sorry, from companies to government, and you have no way to challenge it. Uh, by the way, they wrote the legislation. Um, and also, it would put the government of Canada in the malware business. So this is a multi-billion dollar industry, and all of a sudden, there would be value of the government purchasing ways to attack your phone, your car, other things that track your location that are on your person, and then not report to the vendors, hey, you have this problem, let's fix it. So going back to what I said earlier, it, it raises some concerns around security devices. You know, one of the one of the the, the reactions, almost always, the reaction you get when um, government officials on the rare time will comment on these issues is that they maintain we do not target Canadians, and and that's my emphasis on the word target. Uh, under the law, I'm not allowed to target Canadians in terms of, of picking up surveillance. What do I know that word has been thrown around a lot and, and dissected and debated? Are they accurate in saying that in what we know? And what's the the impact of that that word? What could that what could that word mean? I know that you've written extensively on that. <laughs> um, <word. laughs> let, let me make a, a distinction. Um, if CSIS, Canadian Security Intelligence Service, um, uh, is interested in collecting intelligence on uh, a Canadian in in Canada, what's called a Canadian person? That can be a an individual corporation or university or an entity of public interest um, in Canada or abroad, a Canadian person, they have to they have to get a warrant. So so they can target under very specific circumstances uh, set out in broadly in the CSIS Act. 
If we shift ground now to the, the Signals Intelligence Agency, the Electronic Communications Intercept Agency, Communication Security Establishment Canada, um, they, they are not uh, legally authorized to target Canadians, and they say they do not, uh, but I have to say that they have a definition of targeting, uh, which I happen to have seen, but which is secret. Uh, and, and it is a brilliant lawyer's notion of how to define the term targeting in ways that would not make sense to anyone in this room. <laughs> and this is another problem if when you have, so I've done an access to information request to try and get a classified version of the secret definition of targeting. I think I submitted that about 13 months ago, I'm still waiting. Um, but, but this is one of the problems, that, that when you have laws that aren't sufficiently precise uh, and do not pay, pay attention or keep up with changes, then, then you get these internal secret legal definitions that empower agencies like CSEC to actually target, even though they can say, we don't target, because we have a legal definition protecting us from what we're doing, and, and we don't care if you think it's targeting, it's not called targeting under the law. And when we talk about five eyes, which frankly is just a term I love, um, it's, it's an information sharing agreement between uh, Canada, the US, UK, Australia, and New Zealand, which it just always feels like such a strange partner. But one of the, the agreements is, um, and one of the debates that has come out of the Snowden uh, leaks is you can't target, or, sorry, I'll get away from the word target, you can't monitor your own citizens. One of the questions has been, though, can you do this sort of backdoor monitoring um, with one of the other agencies? So here I am, and, and CSEC, I'm calling Chris, uh, and they're worried about Chris. Um, legally, our agencies can't monitor us. Can one of the other agencies do that? And Largely based on Snowden documents. Um, so uh, that there is a Five Eyes Agreement, and included in that agreement um, is a statement that basically um, we don't monitor one another unless it's in our national interests. And so there's a get out of jail clause. Uh, the other thing that we know from, well, we know many things, but another thing that we know rather from the Everstone documents is that the NSA only shares 1% of everything that it collects. And so that's with its five wise partners, and then there are other sort of tiers in the intelligence sharing community. So large volumes are, are collected, and, and not all of it is shared. The other piece is uh, at least based on public commentary from the, the former head of the NSA. Uh, Canada, it, because of the way our, our, our traffic is routed, it, it almost necessarily goes through the United States in many cases and vice versa at points. So Canada enjoys almost a special relationship with the US in terms of we're not Americans, but we're very hard quite often to sort out from the American buckets. Now, on the one hand, that sounds good. On the other hand, we're learning more and more about how the, the NSA, through its partnerships with uh, either the FBI, um, the DEA, the, Border Patrol and all the other organizations in the US is actually collecting huge volumes of data on American citizens. And so on the one hand, we, we ostensibly enjoy higher protections, if you'll call them that. But the concern is that those high protections are, are not very high in the first place. Um, Chris is absolutely right that there is a, an understanding, I don't think it's explicit in the Five Eyes partnership, that each member of the Five Eyes does not spy on um, any of its partners, except under extraordinary and sort of demanding national security requirements, and those probably don't come up very often. That doesn't get to the heart of the problem around information sharing, uh, though. And and the and so you know the popular notion that, that Canada could go to the NSA and its huge kind of database and bulk surveillance collection and so on, and, and, and simply query the NSA, you know, can you tell us about you know. Canadian X or Canadian Y or you know, a, a, a potential jihadist who's traveling to Syria, whatever it might be, from, from Calgary, which seems to be the latest hotspot according to the National Post. Um, the um, the Canadian authorities, would, uh, it would not be lawful for them to go and make that direct request. 
But on the other hand, there would be nothing preventing, as far as I can tell, nothing preventing any of our Five Eyes partners from volunteering such information to us. If they say, come to Canada and say, you know, we have this interesting collection of information about a Canadian, surely it's a, a value to you. Do you want to talk about the initiative that you just launched yesterday? Sure. Uh, well, I'll talk about the initiative, and then I'll talk about how your Canadian telco is probably selling you out uh, whenever you send confidential information. So uh, in Canada, we really don't know how long a text message is stored. Just think about that for a second. When you send a text message, how long does your telecommunications carrier retain it? Do, does your telecommunications carrier retain logs of every website you've been to? Does your telecommunications carrier keep logs of every place you've been for the past 30 days? We do not know, which to my mind is a travesty. <laughs> so what the Citizen Lab has done is about a month and a half ago, we produced a letter that you copy and paste off the Citizen Lab website, put it in a text pad or Word or whatever, make some changes and then either email it or mail it off. There's a lot of friction, there's no way that's gonna scale and not many people are gonna do that. But it was a test, how did it work? So fast forward to Monday. Um, Citizen Lab has partnered with the Digital Stewards Initiative, uh, who works out of the lab with us. And uh, we found a community partner, Open Media. So if you go to the URL openmedia.ca slash myinfo, you'll see a really nice web app. So what does the web app do? A, it doesn't collect any of your personal information. <laughs> never, leaves your web, never, never touches our servers. But what you'll do is you'll select your ISP, You'll select the services that you have that ISP, and it will automatically generate a letter. You can either print and save as PDF, and then mail it off, and we have the mailing addresses available, or you can automatically email it. It doesn't go through our email servers. It opens up your Outlook or your Gmail or something like that, so you're in control of that data all the way. And then the last step, which is not required, jettison then, is you can contact, or you can sign up to Open Media's um, system and it's been established so that in 30 days and in 60 days, Open Media will come back to you and say, hey, you sent that letter to your telecom provider. When have you heard back? How long is that story for? With the idea being that as individuals, we're really not, we don't have great perspective into this problem. So the idea of the letter being that when that, that goes off, you expect to have a response saying, this is what information we have on you and for how long it's yeah. been stored. L and you have that right because it's your own personal information. Legally, under the Commercial Privacy Act, you can file these requests it, to any company. It doesn't have to be telecom. Um, and so they have to reply to you in 30 days. They can't ask for an extension. And, and I know from speaking with some of the regulatory officers, they're being, they have seen more requests in the past 24 hours than they've seen in all their years of practice. <laughs> Um, so they're expect delays, but within 60 days they have to get back to you And so they have to tell you how long you're storing your data and in one case tech savvy They have actually already modified their practices as a result of the work the lab's been doing So they store data less data for less time because a it's good privacy B it reduces the load on their system and C and they have to send you less information 